Hello, and welcome to another edition of Ask the Professor, a crowd-driven, crowd-funded feature where we respond to your questions on everything from culture to history, economics, geopolitics, political philosophy, all those things that matter to us in our common life as citizens. And today's question comes from Matthew, and he asks, do you think that the Me Too movement is going to help people rediscover the value of traditional sexual morals? He said, it seems as though mere consent isn't enough, particularly because men and women seem to have such different feelings about and attach such different kinds of importance to sex, so that even if women do consent, they often feel used afterwards. And to that question, I say, I believe it's going to happen, and I hope it's going to happen, because I think we really have gotten ourselves into a situation that is very bad for everybody. And you may remember, American Vice President Mike Pence attracted a lot of ridicule when he said that he was not willing to be alone with a woman other than his wife. And people said, oh, that's so stuffy and bourgeois. And then the whole Me Too ruckus erupted. And a lot of people went, well, you know, come to think of it, that might actually be helpful to women. And maybe that's not just entirely retrograde. Now, I think for this to happen, one of the things that we need to do, and this is going to be very hard in the modern world, we need to grasp that there really are fundamental differences between men and women. That there are biological differences that may be shaped by cultural habits, but they're not created by cultural habits. And cultural habits evolve in order to channel these in constructive ways. It doesn't always work, of course, but it's not coming absolutely from nowhere. And you take a lot of heat for saying that these days, oh no, all the differences, gender is a social construct and there's no such thing. And to me, this is a contradictory view because the radicals will also tell you, for instance, about transgender, that somebody can know that they are really a man or really a woman, despite what their body type is and what society is telling them. And I say, well, if gender is socially constructed, how is it possible that someone could know that what society is constructing around them and to which they're hearing little or no opposition, how can they know it's wrong? Besides which, you see the same kind of differentiation between males and females virtually throughout the mammals. I'm not saying we're just animals, but I'm saying that we are animals. And that if this kind of pattern exists in everything, you know, from cats to horses to dogs to monkeys to lemurs to warthogs, and it exists in human beings, there's something very unscientific about saying, yeah, but in human beings, it is a totally different cause than in everything else, including the creatures that we insist we evolved from. So, that being the case, in order to rediscover traditional sexual morals, we have to understand that the differences between men and women, including how we feel about sex, including the extent to which we think that it should be a reflection of emotional intimacy versus it should simply be a really spectacular kind of massage. These things are rooted in inherent differences in the genders and that we need rules that make cooperative sense out of both genders' attitudes toward the whole complex thing that results when boy meets girl. I think Matthew's absolutely right that this whole thing of consent, I mean, quite apart from the fact that, you know, whipping out a form partway through a date is, is an absolute buzz killer. Or, or the claim, you know, if you've had anything to drink, you can't consent. You know, there is a reason that people will have a drink or two on a date. And it's not that they have been deceived by social convention into thinking that rape is sex. Far from it. But in days of yore, there was a broad social understanding about the fact that men were, quite frankly, more keen on sex without strings attached, and that everybody needed to be wary of this. Women needed to be wary of it, or they'd get used, and men needed to be wary of it, or else they would use women. And it was understood in those days, this is one of the things that I think radical feminists very much overlook, that when men talked about my better half, they really meant it. They really understood that it was essential that men's more energetic but less attractive impulses should be channeled through women's approval. But it was also understood... And I think we need to recapture this understanding, too, that women are not simply victims. Women are not entirely passive. They are not entirely helpless. One of the odd things about the modern feminist narrative is that women often come across sounding like the frail, fainting hero of some third-rate Victorian melodrama. Women are moral agents, too, and women are capable of being manipulative. Women are capable of being cruel. They're even capable of being violent in relationships. There is a great deal more interpartner violence 
where women are the perpetrator, sometimes it's both parties, sometimes it's just the woman, though of course also it's sometimes just the man. There's a lot more of that than we let on. The evil lurks in the human heart, not just the male heart. So we need to recapture rules that said that sex is like fire. It is very useful, it is very beneficial, it can feel very good, but it mustn't be allowed to run out of control. That says women should not simply be playthings for men. That was always the dark side of sexuality, traditional or modern. It's one of the things I think we overlook is to the extent to which in a world of hookups and casual sex, women are being used in the most extraordinarily exploitative way. And the fact that Hugh Hefner preached liberation doesn't change a thing about that. We need to understand also that the channeling of men's impulses into constructive outlets, including the desire for sex leading to the desire for partnership and family, was a very good thing. But we also need to understand that women can be emotionally manipulative, that women can be inconsistent, that women do lie. Not all of them and not all the time, but the idea that women never lie is preposterous. It reduces women to dolls. It dehumanizes them. Traditional sexual morals were not perfect. No human contrivance is perfect. We can always critique, we can always try to improve. But the notion that there should be some kind of civilized courtship, that you shouldn't have sex on a first date, that sex outside of long-term commitment is really not a good thing for either party. Not that a little experimentation is a terrible thing, but as a pattern, it is destructive of your long-term happiness. We need to recapture all of th these things. We need to recapture the value of monogamy, of fidelity, of the orientation of sex toward fertility and to the creation and the raising of children. If we don't do that, it's a very nasty free-for-all out there. And if women are feeling angry and used, and the Me Too movement is partly a reflection of this anger, we need to understand that it's not stemming from men behaving in traditional ways, but to a very large degree, men not behaving in traditional ways, expecting a woman to have sex without any kind of emotional attachment or long-term commitment. What woman wouldn't resent that? But that's not the message of the traditionalists. That's the message of the swingers, of the liberated, of this weird alliance of radical feminism with the playboy philosophy. I don't think men and women can be happy together without respect, without commitment, without fidelity, and a great sex life is a good thing to have along with all that. But let's, for goodness sakes, put finding ways to be complementary, to have yin and yang fit together at the core of it, emotionally, intellectually, becoming one flesh, forming a family unit. Let's understand the proper place of sex and the proper way in which men from Mars and women from Venus can meet on Earth and have fruitful partnerships. If we don't do that, I don't see any way to tamp down the rage and frustration on both sides. So yes, I very much hope we're going to rediscover the value of traditional sexual morality, because if we don't, I simply can't see any way forward. Now, if you're enjoying Ask the Professor and you'd like to submit a question, this is the URL that will take you to the place on my website where you can do it. And because this, like almost all my work, is crowdfunded, if you think it's worthwhile, please also visit my website by clicking here, make a contribution, one-off or monthly, to sustain this and the other work that I do. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.